Welcome to the lab at Canvas. We're back for our second session. With me today, once again, is Amy, James, Madison, Michelle, and Ted. My name is Ken, and I will be your moderator for this evening. We are resuming our exploration on the images of God. If you recall, last time we were confronting what um, our own personal as well as what we have seen in the culture, the views of the image of God. And so tonight, what we're going to do is we're going to try to take a step back. Because we confronted what we know, we want to take a step back and deconstruct. Where did this come from? And also, as Christians, what is acceptable? What what? What do we see as within bounds? What do we see as out of bounds? And some of the best ways to understand what you are is to take a look at what you're not. From the previous session till now, have you had any additional thoughts, additional things you've run into, things that you, know, you might want to kind of share? Well, I'm really excited about tonight because the last time when we met and I went back and I read through the research that all these people put together, I was just fascinated with the wide range of diversity, mm -hmm. right? And re rethinking of our conversation that we had, like you said earlier, we, we all have these different ideas in our own head. And then you look at this spread across history and it was just fascinating all the stuff that you guys produced that just show how pluriform and diverse this whole concept is. I was just really taken aback by that. I loved it. Are you excited to dig into it tonight? Absolutely. For me, it was surprising in my research, looking at especially like the Abrahamic religious traditions of Christianity, Islam, Judaism, and that in my research, there was this very big designation where it said, well, God doesn't have pronouns, but we use like, because he's greater than man and woman, but we mainly use he. And like this idea of, okay, so it's the global he then. Sue Monk Kidd, who's an author, she uh, wrote a book recent in the last few years called The Book of Longings, which was took place kind of in the time of Jesus. And she had a character who met with another with other groups of women in like Alexandria and worshipped Sophia, which was the feminine representation of God. And that was like the first and only time I've seen like the feminine representation, like more God the mother than God the father. Mm. Um but like not necessarily finding anything like in my research that says like, oh yeah, this was something that that was expected. So, or was done or whether it was just a sprinkling of fiction. So. Amy. I'm super excited to dig into it. And I'm excited to find out all the ways in which the research I did was wrong. Because you know how it is when you're like, we're, I'm not a scholar. I'm just doing. Re I'm just doing research. I, I have the power of Google at my fingertips, and that is how I'm basically finding everything. And so, it's always interesting to see w when you're doing research in this way, like, and it's not super deep, you know what's right what's wrong how close did you get you know like um i'm talking about like art history and i don't know a thing about art history so i can't wait to like you know dig more into that so we're going to start our discussion by looking at the polytheistic uh religions we're going to table the the major abrahamic religions for now mm -hmm. right but if you take them out of the equation the, the religion with the most followers on earth right now is gonna be Hinduism. What would these types of imagery provide for their followers? I think it's, it's extraordinary how so many of the world's religions, not all, but so many, use the human body as a jumping off point for their, um, their gods. And I think in every culture, you have to have some kind of visual form 
to associate with the supernatural. I believe that's called anthropomorphism. But you have this idea that there's something greater than you, but you can only have it in your own experience. Right. So when you have a pantheon, you can go to whoever you need to relate to in that given moment. And mm -hmm. I know for some people it's more one than another, I think. I just think it's interesting how complex it is, right? Theology, no matter what the, the tradition is, is very complex. So when I look at these images, I see the fact that throughout most of history, people were not literate. They couldn't read. They had oral stories, so they understood the, the words. But when they were trying to communicate, they didn't have a written word. So they used images because that saying, you know, a picture's worth a thousand words is so true. And I, it's interesting because the pictures and the images almost remove the ability to have conflict, right? Because if it's words, we can argue about words. But if it's pictures, you could see it it's totally different than I could see it. And there's room for generosity in those mm -hmm. images. Well, I'm gonna move us on to the next topic of discussion. We also looked into indigenous cultures. There was a lot of animistic mm -hmm. uh, cultures and, and what animistic means or what animism means is the belief that objects, places, um, creatures, animals possess a distinctive spirit, um, you know, power, uh, godly element. What do we think that provided for their followers? And a lot of the research that I found, part of it was they, they saw God in every natural thing so for them it was just part of their their way of life and their community of you know the different you know plants or the different um, animals that were that were in their their natural habitat and that each tribe um, the the same kind of is that each tribe as there are many tribes different tribes there are that many different creation stories and beliefs but it was all around them all the time so it was very easy for them to just be surrounded by it and feel that they were surrounded by by god and their creator i i read a story about the you know the thunderbird that came down and saved this guy who was being pulled under the water and the thunderbird dove in and fought off the snake and pulled the guy out of the water and saved his life and so there's like um I, I think that's something that we don't have, that we lack um, a little bit, is our connection with our natural world is, is not as uh, integrated into our storytelling, I think, and in, in, we, don't, we don't necessarily make um, animals the heroes of our stories. For us, uh, people are more likely to be the heroes of our stories. And you see in Native American cultures how often animals, things from nature, take the place of the hero of the story. May I chime in? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. We had a really interesting conversation, my daughter and I, the other day about um, the indigenous peoples in... Mexico and South America in New Spain. When they were conquered by the Spaniards, they were easily conquered because their worldview was completely different than the worldview of the Spaniards. Now, how is this related to what you say? I'll tell you. Um, the the Judeo-Christian idea and the cultural paradigm for the Judeo-Christian cultures is that man has dominion over mm -hmm. everything. And this idea in cre the creation story that man ha people have dominion over everything is completely different than the cyclical nature of, for example, the Aztecs. Everything is purified, it dies, it's rejuvenated. Now, that makes for a culture that's more interested in purification and rejuvenation as opposed to having dominion. Mm -hmm. People who have dominion conquer. People who are cyclical in nature 
are interested in, in getting to know you and having, having some kind of relationship with you. I said earlier we were going to table the Abrahamic religions. Now we're going to bring them forward. So from the Abrahamic religions, what I'm essentially talking about, aside from our own, is Judaism and, and Islam. Mm -hmm. Both of these religions practice a Nikonism. And a Nikonism is basically uh, not having any images of God, and, and in fact, forbidding images of God because uh, it would lead to idolatry or the creation of idols. I'm going to ask a similar question again. What do we think the absence of imagery in this case might uh, do for the followers of these religions? Many times it has been said how incomprehensible mm -hmm. our God is. God's ways are not our ways. His ways are above our ways. He would see things that we do not see. By if we were to kind of try to cast and create an image, it helps us to start defining and boxing and categorizing. James? Well, I, I've spent a lot of time studying this kind of stuff, so I really like this topic a lot. Um, there's this great book that I read by J. Richard Middleton, and it's impossible to summarize that book because it's got a lot of stuff in there. So the basic idea in his book, if I try to boil it down, which I'm not going to do justice, is that the, the Judaic idea of the image of God is not a no novel idea. It was not an original idea. They stole that concept from ancient Mesopotamia. And so you can't really understand the right way that they look at it unless you understand the creation story that it's part of. And you can't really understand that unless you understand all the other creation stories that were surrounding. Mm -hmm. So if you summarize all those creation stories of ancient Near East Mesopotamia, whether it's Murdoch, Amun-Ra, uh, Anil, they're all very similar in that there's multiple gods. They're very violent. They are at war with each other constantly. And either through their sexual reproduction or through the violence of bloodshed of their war, creation develops and mankind is produced. And the sole purpose of man is to serve the gods. And to serve the gods, they put an image of God either in the king or the priest. So the theology kind of creates a canopy for the political systems of the day. So along comes this tribe who's captive and in in captivity in Babylon, and they say, we don't like that story, so we're going to tell a completely different story. And instead of a violent pantheon of gods, they talk about a gracious God who plants a garden and gives it to man and puts his image in man, women and men equally. And so the image of God doesn't rest with the king or the priest. It rests on everybody. There is no hierarchy. It's total flat structure. And you're not, you're not here to serve the God. God's here to serve you. You don't have to produce food for the gods. He's given a garden for you. And it's just a beautiful story. And in that context, it would have been very, very uh, dissident political thing to stand up to Nebuchadnezzar and say, for you, it's okay for you to put us in bondage and make bricks for you or for Pharaoh or whoever. But our God is a liberating God. He's going to set us free eventually because this is not right. So their theology creates a context for liberating people from hierarchy, from people having dominion over each other. Christianity somewhere lost the plot and ended up going right back to dominance and competition. But that original story of the creation narratives is a beautiful story. Does anybody want to kick us off and talk about why or what they have found on why we are no longer, or why we are not, a Nikonistic. The Renaissance. <laughs> I, I was going to say I think Michelle could probably speak to this question better than I could, but the history of the history of Christianity is very complex. We've been fighting about it for two thousand years, but it really didn't come into like a a form where we could like put a label on it until. Ambrose and Constantine. And so it took the reflection of the political system of its day, which was the Roman political system. That's what gave birth to our v versions 
of Christianity. If you read Joseph Campbell's The Power of Myth, or if you read Science or Atheist Today, when they say Christian, what they really mean is Roman Catholic, because that's what shapes everything that comes after it. The Protestant comes after that, the Protestant Reformation, the Eastern Orthodox Church comes after that. So history, for better or for worse, equates Christianity with the Roman Catholic tradition, which is modeled on the Roman government, which sees Caesar as God. And so it was a very logical step to create an image of our God that modeled what the political power, I, I think. The idea, as James said, of having imperial iconography. Also, you've got to remember that for centuries, people were illiterate. We've mentioned this before. And the images of the church were absolutely necessary in order to promote the, the religion. People needed to see the stories of the Bible on the doors of the church because they needed to know that they needed to be saved. And they needed to know what they believed. And they had to have some kind of way of expressing that. I know last time I, I, I told you that we would, we would try to strictly stay within um, God the Father, God Almighty. But let's talk about Jesus. <laughs> now, uh, we know that the image of Jesus has always been around, mm -hmm. essentially, right? And Tan, I think you have mentioned before that there's a lot of what I can just say is adaptability oh, yeah. of Jesus Absolutely. Uh, to the the region to the, the followers um, and what I want to kind of talk about is the acceptability of Jesus uh, and the imagery of Jesus there's a church in Kenya that um, I found they had created the Stations of the Cross. And they, they got local artists to create the images. In fact, um, the second one from the right on the top is from it. Mm. And they put in the background, and I don't know if you can see it from here, but the local town imagery from the local town in Kenya is actually painted in the background behind these depictions. And of course, the locals are portrayed as all the characters in the story. Um, and they were talking about how excited these people were to connect with the, this imagery because they felt like, oh, this is our God. Beautiful. You know, he, this is a God that cares about us. And so it was fascinating to to see that, like, OK, yeah, is that is that what it would have looked like in Israel or, you know, no. But is this the story and is it for these people? Yes. Mm -hmm. I think the localized expressions and the cultural expressions are a better reflection of the original creation story of the image of God resting in all of us equally. And it kind of ties into the gospel message at the nativity when the angels say, I bring you good news for all people, that God is with us. Because when God looks like us, then he really does feel like he's with us. Mm -hmm. So it's nice. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, the reason I, I wanted to interject is that that's, that's not new. The, no. the cathedrals yeah. of Europe are populated by statues of, of the yeah. community. Mm -hmm. And those are people that were actually there and who contributed to the building of the church. And it's just, it's underlying your point that it mm -hmm. makes it relevant to the community. And I think that's what we forget when we go touring through these monumental architectural wonders that these were built by the community for the community as an expression of the community and the statues and the stained glass windows mm -hmm. and everything about the cathedrals and the churches of all of Europe and I would even guess of Byzantium 
are populated by images of the people who built the churches. And I know you want to move forward, but one additional icon, one additional thing that I, I personally found very, very fascinating, which again made sense, was that it wasn't, I mean, we can talk about Jesus, but as it was most Roman Catholics were the ones that are primarily the ones getting purchase in uh, Southeast Asia, the number of icons and images of Mary as well. <laughs> I just transitioned our, our, our visual aid to, let's talk wow, about you're Mary. Like a, like a, remote, a human remote control, I like it too. So, so I'm going to let you finish your thought. But, you know, we, I don't think we could escape tonight's discussion without talking about Mary. And, and let me kind of set up where I want to take this, right? Um, we understand that, you know, there was a lot of discussion when it came to God the Father and the images of God the Father, right? Universally, it seemed like images of Jesus, A-OK, right? And it also seemed like imagery of Mary um, from the very simple to the almost divine, uh, to actual divine. To actual, to actual <laughs> divine um, was also a okay, and I think one of the things that I would like us to discuss is why do we think Mary is such a big deal? And so, Tan, why is Mary such a big deal? Wow, there are so many reasons why Mary is such a big deal. Mary is such a big deal. I know in certain cultures, it was an easy transition from the mother goddess, mother fertility goddess. It was an easy bridge. It was an easy connection from there. I think that Mary is the, even, even more so, she's the sort of acceptability of women in a culture that doesn't accept women. She's, she's a um, prime example of, a human that is godly in her response to Gabriel when she says, my soul magnifies the Lord. I think mm -hmm. we want that to be the truth. I think we want Mary to, to tell us that we are special. And yet at the same time, Mary's role was to be quiet and to give birth. And I, I'm I'm getting a little like in a in a whole nother whole area, but other area. But there's there's a lot of I I find it to be problematic. May I say you, you one find more thing? What part to be problematic? All of it. <laughs> Mary I find, is a problem. I find I find the way that we need Mary to be problematic because God doesn't give us what we need hmm. because God doesn't give us the feminine side. We have to go to Mary to get it. We have to turn to Mary for that imagery. We have to turn to Mary for that connection. We have to turn to Mary for our value. We don't get it from Jesus. We don't get it from God. That's the problem that I have with the imagery that has been presented throughout the years. I think that's probably absolutely true. The imagery is very problematic. God, God, God of itself, I'm not saying is problematic. It's the imagery the, that... The imagery is problematic. And considering we're in a very paternalistic, always have been a very paternalistic patriarchal society, it makes sense in a way of why the imagery would ignore any of those like feminine motherly portions that are in our own stories of creation type thing, right? I bounce back and forth because I mean, for me, I have heard of, I, I, I can't under, I can only relate partially, but I mean, I have heard of many people growing up, you know, trying to, Repurpose is not the correct word, but they made a conscious effort of saying mother God using feminine terms. I've we talked very briefly that it would be the heap is supposed to be represent the global he, but in our culture and over years and years and years of he, 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 it's become from 
gender neutral to gendered. And if we try to counterculture that, it, is, it becomes counterculture. We're trying to say mother God, people give you weird looks. People, mm -hmm. Some people might pres express understanding and see the importance of it, but it would be an interesting example and a question that I have posed to people like, so what's the problem with mother God? And a lot of people are like, oh, it just makes me uncomfortable. I'm like, I personally believe that the Bible is the most generous book towards women that's ever been written. I would agree Now, we can have that regards. conversation <laughs> outside of the concept of the image of God. I think it's rooted in the image of God, but it's hard to get into that in this context. Mm -hmm. Well, it's also hard, too, because I feel like the distortions that have happened over time don't reflect the true religion. Absolutely. They don't reflect our true God. They don't reflect the nature of that even Jesus was teaching us, yes, right? absolutely. And we as human beings are so good at distorting things, at twisting things, at, at coming at them and changing them into man manipulations for power. And I think that this, this topic is one of those examples of of power twisting imagery it's, to pass down a certain. It's absolutely, yeah. I would agree with you 100%. So if I'm gonna you, take, sorry. I'll, if I'll, you think about Christianity as the religion of Jesus is completely different than what people have transformed it into. Mm -hmm. And if you think about Mary as the mother who bore Jesus and who lived in a simple little town in the backwaters of the Roman Empire and who wasn't particularly valued in her own world. She's a whole lot different than the Madonna that we see emblazoned in the churches of Europe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I would like to offer to you that that whole idea of the Madonna emblazoned in the churches of Europe is just as much a political manifestation of the male-dominated society as anything else. How I want to wrap this up is, now that we've confronted it and we've kind of done some dissection, the question is, how comfortable do we feel, this group at this table, with where we are now? How comfortable am I? It is, the reason why it is difficult for me to answer is because I don't place the priority necessarily on my own comfort because I have seen how useful and how important these images can be to have certain people have a genuine connection with God. And at the same time, I have we have had it expressed here where those certain images can also be just as deeply painful, mm -hmm. conflicting, frustrating. And so it's extremely difficult for me to know. For me, uh, perhaps I'm on the more apathetic side, people will do as they will. But it is something for me that I cannot make a decision because I have seen how the strong evidence and the importance of it on both sides. I think for me, like I came in with God very much, my view of God, of the image of God was very much more kind of in nature from some of the stories that we share with our Abrahamic siblings. For me, because I've never been personally able to have that image of the old white guy God. Like I've seen images, but like to me that just, isn't God like for me like seeing more like evidence of like the nature based like that was like kind of comfortable like okay like you're too big to for me to understand who you are but kind of in ways of nature like I can kind of see you type thing. My thought is that if my image of God remains stagnant so does my faith. Mm -hmm. I think that as time goes on, as you live your life, you have to have 
a changing image of who God is because as you live your life, you see so many different glimpses of him. Well, I think there's no doubt in my, among the table here that I came into this with a lot of baggage around this particular image. Mm -hmm. um, this and, you know, the research that I've been doing is all about how damaging this image has mm -hmm. been. So I'm reading account after account of how this image has been painful for uh, the black community, for other minority groups, for women, for the LGBTQ community. Mm -hmm. I have gone through this world feeling inferior in so many ways because of this image. Mm -hmm. So do we have a problem with this image? Yes, I have a problem with this image. I have a problem with this image too, for different reasons than you, but I can totally understand why you have those images or those those issues. So I've always been attracted to dissidents. I don't know what that is about, but I have been. Uh, I read every dissident book I can get my hands on. And when I read the text of our scriptures, I see that voice, I hear that voice everywhere. And our creation story is just such a powerful example. And so for me, when I want to really experience the presence or the image of God, I try to find people who are willing to ask these kinds of questions. So I really am excited that you guys created this space for this diverse group of people to have this conversation because Jesus says, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them, right? So his image, all the way from the very beginning, has rested in all of us equally. And when we gather together, my warped little image of God looking like me or God looking like my tribe gets expanded immediately because I'm surrounded with people, by people who don't look like me. They're from a different gender. They're from a different race. They identify completely different pronouns than I do. And so there's two quotes that have always been really important to me. And I think Tony Campolo is one. And he, he has this great story where he says, tell me about this God that you don't believe in because I probably don't believe in him either. So I just think that's so funny because as people describe it, right, the more we go down that road, you eventually get to a point like, I can't pick up what this person's laying down. That doesn't sound like the God I believe in. And the other one is Anne Lamott. And she says, it's pretty safe to say that when God hates all the same people that we hate, we've made God in our image instead of God making us in his image. Mm -hmm. And I just like those. So I really try to live my life every day. If I approach somebody and they frustrate me or I get so wrapped up that I, it pushes me to the edges of my pacifism, I go, this person's created in the image and likeness of God. Mm -hmm. And the, the feelings that I have towards them right now are actually directed towards God. And if my problem is with that person, then I have serious problems with my continuity with my theology. So I like that. I don't have to be able to explain philosophical concepts like personhood and nature. I can just tell a simple story and say, if I have a problem with you, the problem is with me, <laughs> right? My theology supports that and I like that. The purpose of our last session mm -hmm. is to take a look at some of the things that we've discovered, right? Some of the things that over time has been, I think the word we used was twisted, right? What we wanna explore is, is it possible for us at this little table to think about ways to untwist, untwist with love, right? And I think James, you've said it, like when we look at the Bible, when we, when we look deeper uh, without the accoutrements of time, we may find some answers to help us really kind of understand how to do some of this interesting. And I look forward to the next time when we get back together so that let's think about it from an aspect of love. Mm -hmm. How can we individually help untwist some of this? And maybe how we as a church, seeing as the lab is part of Canvas, as a church can start to untwist some of these things that we have noticed. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for joining me tonight. I look forward to seeing all of you next time.